In line with the dictates of this article, the courts have all along distinguished the legislative role of parliament from its administrative and quasi-judicial functions. All down the Bombarde and Sabina Chege. Consequently, the courts have only exercised their supervisory jurisdiction to review the quasi-judicial and administrative functions of the parliament when either vetting or considering petitions for the removal of persons from office. However, honorable members, the courts have always refrained from interfering with the lawmaking powers of parliament. They have consistently limited themselves to reviewing the content of bills after their enactment into law. Indeed, any interference of the court in the consideration of a bill that is actively before the legislature would constitute a striking departure from established constitutional precedent and practice both in the Commonwealth and the congressional systems. This is a matter which both the court itself and my predecessors have ruled on. In South Africa, the court has held as much in the celebrated case of Doctors for Life International versus the Speaker of the National Assembly and others, CCT 12 of 206 ZACC 11. In declining to interfere in the consideration of a bill, the court held that South African constitutional scheme contemplates that challenges to the constitutional validity of a bill passed by Parliament must await the completion of the legislative process. Honorable members, with the foregoing distinction in mind, I note that the House has been taken before the courts, has been taken before before the courts, including by its own members, and the courts have ruled both in favor and against this House. The House will recall that in the 11th Parliament, the leader of the minority party, the current leader, the Honorable James Opio and I, MGH MP, did successfully challenge his suspension from the service of the House for the remainder of the fourth session. In his suit, the Honorable Member for Ugunja challenged provisions of the standing orders on the fairness of the penalties relating to disorderly conduct. The litigation by the leader of the minority party significantly contributed to the amendments made to the standing orders to provide for different categories of disorderly conduct, graduated penalties ranging from suspension for a day to a maximum of 90, days calen 90 calendar days and an appellate process. During the same 11th Parliament, members will also recall that the court injuncted the Departmental Committee on Finance and National Planning and Lands from considering petitions submitted to the House for the removal of the then Auditor General and the then Chairperson of the National Land Commission, respectively, pursuant to the provisions of Article 251 of the Constitution. Despite the disaffection of the House and the presidium with the orders granted in the foregoing cases, the House nevertheless observed the directions issued by the Court and halted its quasi-judicial and administrative processes. Notably, in guiding the House on the order issued with regard to the petition for the removal of the Auditor General, my predecessor, the Honorable Speaker Justin Muturi, rightly noted that the only avenue available in law to express disagreement with a judicial finding is an appeal against the decision of the Court. Honorable Members, I have in this 13th Parliament had occasion to uphold my predecessor's guidance in relation to court orders made against the House and its committees in relation to the exercise of quasi-judicial and administrative functions. Members will recall that on 15th of November 2022, the Employment and Labor Relations Court granted conservative orders staying the vetting of nominees for appointment as principal secretaries in constitutional petition E186 of 2022, Dr. Mogare Gikeni versus the President of the Republic of Kenya and 55 others, and in constitution petition number E192 of 2022, 
the Law Society of Kenya versus the National Assembly and four others. In deference to the direction of the court with respect to the applicable administrative process, I did notify the House of the suspension of the vetting process despite the discomfort that the decision caused to the business of this House. Immediately thereafter, I instructed our litigation counsel to challenge the orders in court. As your speaker, I remain cognizant of the obligation imposed by Article 3 of the Constitution on me to respect, defend, and uphold the Constitution in guiding the proceedings of the House. On one hand, the minority party has met all the procedural requirements to effect a change of its leadership. On the other hand, I'm confronted by a court order that specifically cited both the Speaker and the House as parties to a judicial process that seems to challenge an administrative process. Despite the sympathies I may hold for the predicament that the minority party finds itself, this House has consistently demonstrated its willingness to abide by court orders, by orders of the court relating to the exercise of its quasi-judicial and administrative functions. Even where certain orders have been adverse to the interests of the House, we have dutifully obeyed them and sought to set aside the orders that we were not in agreement with. From the foregoing, my hands are therefore tied with regard to the court order that has been brought to my attention. Until and unless further information is provided that this order has been varied or set aside, the court order effectively suspends the decision by the minority party on the replacement of the Honorable Sabina Chege as the debut minority whip. As a seasoned legislator and experienced party leader myself, my heart sinks wherever I see a dispute that may be resolved through internal dispute resolution mechanisms being referred to in an adversarial court system. In my experience, court battles may be counterproductive and may ultimately destroy long-standing political relationships. I encourage the minority party and the Jubilee party to seek an amicable resolution of whatever it is that may be the bone of contention with the coalition and between the members of its constituent party. I am confident that an amicable resolution of the issues shall positively contribute to the continuity of the business of the House and its vibrancy. In issuing my communication of 4th May 2023, I did guide that I was hesitant to recognize the Jubilee Party as a parliamentary party despite its meeting the threshold prescribed under the standing order. At this stage, I am still hesitant to recognize the party. Order, order, order. Obviously, obviously, the two gracious ladies are not being choked by anything, and their conduct is constituting a nuisance, and any further interruptions will attract some penalties. Honorable members, in the current situation persists and provided with all relevant particulars by the Jubilee Party, I may have no choice but to recognize the party. In the meantime, what is available to Honorable Wandai, I have ruled that you have procedurally followed every step and have no difficulty with your decision to remove your debut whip. But there is a court order to which, strangely, your party and your coalition is not a part of the proceedings. I would advise you that you seek to enjoin yourselves with the proceedings, if you wish, and pursue the matter in court. I have already 
I have already instructed our litigation team to end appearance and robustly defend the speaker, the clerk, and the National Assembly in this matter. It is so ordered.